this roadmap to the site, nothing actually happened. And I would not expect everything to happen, uh, except, for example, of, uh, you, know, you know, single currency, which Lukashenko proposes, uh, about uh, the single, uh, the united leadership of the military forces, which Lukashenko proposes. And so, therefore, I would say that uh, Franek is absolutely right, saying that uh, no one should fear the integration like it looks now, except one point, I, I would add. This point is about economy. And uh, what was what is uh, changing now is the increase of economic influence of Russia over Belarus. It's not only about, uh, it's not only because of new loans and financial assistance Russia produces, but first of all, because of Western sanctions, I would say Russia will uh, become, will get more and more control over Belarusian strategic industries. For example, the potassium industry, uh, because I think the uh, oil products will be exported via Russia uh, with uh, Russian counterparts, with Russian intermediaries. And therefore, I think that even part of the former revenues Lukashenko got from the strategic industries will somehow flow or flew into Belarus from the Russian side. And this will increase because uh, Russia has a lot of interest in uh, controlling Belarusian strategic enterprises. Uh, there are some Russian oligarchs who are very interested in doing this uh, for purely economic reasons. And uh, this is where the interests of Russian political elite and Russian business elite actually coincide. And therefore, I would say that uh, Belarus will presumably will lose part of its economic independence even it uh, remains a fully independent country politically, as it can be seen from abroad. And as uh, several uh, points I, I would uh, mention, then I would stop. First of all, I, uh, I would say that Russia is, from my point of view, is not entirely interested in fully integrating or enclosing Belarus uh, in, into Russia for different reasons, because Belarusian people are much more now at least uh, pro-European, they are much more independently thinking. Uh, they are much more prone to act politically uh, as they did in 2020. Nothing uh, comparable happened to Russia for 20 years. And so I would doubt that Mr. Putin wants to get another 9 million citizens uh, into Russian citizenship uh, who might become quite, you know, a driving force for new uh, this time Russian protests in, in some cases. Uh, another point is that uh, I absolutely exclude the possibility that Mr. Putin will embrace Ms. Lukashenko, uh, Ms. Tikhanovska uh, sometime, even if uh, uh, there are another wave of protests in Belarus. I think that after what happened in 2020 and 2021, he will never have a dialogue with, uh, uh, with Svetlana. Uh, and if, uh, Putin, or if Russia will back some, if Russia backs uh, some opposition figure in Belarus, it will definitely not be Svetlana because Mr. Putin definitely don't want to have any deals with someone uh, who is backed by the popular movement. He is very proud of this. Uh, the last point is about uh, the Western political attitude and what can be done. Actually, I will just send to anybody my recent article in The Independent, it was published on December 2nd, when in Brussels, the anti, anti Lukashenko sanctions were debated. And actually, I think that uh, sanction policies should be tightened and it should be uh, aimed on cutting all trade flows from, uh, from and via Belarus, because actually Belarus is a very high, uh, it's a very important transit route for the Russian goods uh, coming to Europe and for European goods coming to Russia. And uh, also, it's uh, it is seen as a part of maybe uh, China Europe corridor versus Russia and Belarus. So, if uh, the Europeans uh, can actually completely cut all the transit flows from uh, via Belarus, it will be a very huge blow to Russia, even psychologically. Yeah, so, there are a lot of uh, other kind of sanctions which should be, I think, implemented. And what is most important, and I will will stop here, that all these sanctions. Uh, the Europeans or the Americans or the British, they should make it very clear that all these sanctions will automatically be expanded on Russia if Russia 
incorporates Belarus in its uh, in its political structure. So uh, Putin should understand that if he wants to get Belarus, he will, will get this with a lot of other problems he will incorporate in daily Russian life. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Vladislav. Um, some very interesting points. Actually, on, on the last point of sanctions, just to mention that our next webinar in a week's time will be dedicated to sanctions. So I do hope that uh, you will attend it um, as well, together with our um, uh, large audience. Thank you. Uh, this, what you've mentioned there, uh, uh, sort of suggesting that perhaps deeper integration may not necessarily be the case, but deeper dependency of Belarus on Russia is definitely going to be paced, actually takes us very neatly to Arkady. And I hope that Arkady will be able to say a few words, uh, the views um, over the, across the border. So Arkady, what's the view on the situation from Finland? Thank you. Well, I'm thankful for the invitation, but I will give you my point of view. I, I will probably disappoint you for Belarus in a situation, Belarus especially now, is not at the center of attention in Finland. So there's a group of people that follows it, but this group is still small. Uh, I'll make several points. One is, uh, I'll also have an opinion, of, I also have an opinion about the integration, a, a, a terminological opinion. I think that essentially it's, it's, it's a wrong term. Speaking about integration, the way we know it from Europe in the Russian, uh, Belarusian case is irrelevant. It's essentially a bureaucratic exercise. Some people were paid for more than two decades for reshuffling papers, which they did successfully and they continue doing so. And this um, 28 programs that we've been talking uh, earlier today is a great example. People were negotiating this document for three years. Its validity was 26 months. It's only valid until the end of 2023. In order to enact this document, according to the Russian prime minister, we would need another three to 400 acts passed by respective parliaments and so on and so forth. Probably people who negotiated or authored that document know how weak it is and how it would not be able to pass any scrutiny. And that's why it has not been published. There's no text to analyze because I suspect it's absolutely empty. There is one great program on cooperation in the field of tourism. Okay, that's, that's definitely important, but maybe that we should know a little bit more about what has been uh, prepared by, 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 by the two diplomatic teams. I suspect that pretty much the same can be said about the new military doctrine of the Union State. Because some people were thinking it's an innovation. It's not. The military doctrine of the Union State existed, has existed since 2001. Yes, this current one was negotiated also for a long time and Lukashenko was trying to make it a kind of a instrument or lever vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But the point is that it's probably not that important. What is important is exactly what Yelena has said. We should ask ourselves a question, whether Belarusian, Belarusian depend or Belarus's dependence on Russia has reached a critical degree. Because it has, this country has been going along the way towards the increase of its, of its dependence on structural dependence on Russia, I repeat. Not since the day Lukashenko came to power in 94, but since the day Putin came to power and Lukashenko faced choices before that he could have had illusions whether he was going to become a president of Russia one day. But from that moment on, it should have been clear to everybody that he wasn't. So he had choices to make and he made the choices and the choices were the increasing Belarus's dependence on Russia. If you look three, I mean, Vladislav has been talking about the economy. Uh, the, it's, it, it is kind of obvious that if your economy should be subsidized by Russia at times by 20% of GDP, and in better days to 10 to 15% GDP, your freedom of maneuver is pretty much limited. If you sell your biggest asset or give, not even sell, give it to the Gazprom, I mean the gas transportation system, 
which Ukraine refused to do, and that's why he kept certain leverage, which Belarus hasn't. You should understand that the economic underpinning of your independence is not that great. And that was Lukashenko's choice. And that was Lukashenko's choice to bring Russia, to bring Belarus into the Eurasian Economic Union, a community before. It's not because somebody twisted his hands, as it was in the case of Armenia. It's because he thought that was right for his country. If you look at the policy, which should be the backbone of, of a sovereignty of any country, which is the education policy, what was the ideological policy of Lukashenko? That Belarusians are Russians with a quality stamp, that probably education in Belarusian is not that much needed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there is any university in Belarus with the Belarusian as a language of instruction. Uh, and so on. And that could have been changed. But he didn't want to change it because he thought the right way to go was basically to exterminate the Belarusian ethnic, not even necessarily ethnic based identity, but the features that would uh, differentiate, distinguish Belarusians from the Russians. There was a point when 65%, according to official data, when 65% of content in all the Belarusian media was coming from Moscow and so on and so forth. And then you take security uh, sphere. I mean, Belarus was considered to be an extension of Russia in the military sense for uh, more than a decade by now. And uh, again, that was because he thought that was the way for him to go because he, like his uh, like-minded people in Kremlin thought that a threat to Belarus would be coming from the West that NATO was the enemy, that NATO was the problem. And that's why he wanted to have this integrated air defense and, and hundreds and hundreds, if you take years, drills, exercises of different scale, all this West exercises, all this Union Shield, you name it. I mean, it's been going on for decades. So is there an independent Belarusian military at the moment? Probably not. I mean, if there's anything integrated into the Russian military, it is the Russian, the Russian, the Belarusian, into the Russian military, it is the Belarusian system. So, but this is not the end, and this is where the paradoxes start, because if you ask the question, you can still argue it both ways, because you can say that the critical degree has been achieved. I was saying it myself for many years. If you read everything I wrote between 2015 and 2020, uh, when so many colleagues were enjoying the policy of sun, sun warmth that the West was conducting towards Lukashenko, of which I was radically critical and couldn't, could ever, couldn't ever agree with that policy. So uh, one of the conclusions that I was making was that Russia was not concerned at all. I mean, you, 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 okay, there were, there were some signs that there might have been certain disagreement in Kremlin. Of course, there was no trust to Lukashenko, but there was no real concern. Russians knew that the dependence was high enough so that they could take it easily. Thank you. Thank but, you, Arkady. But this is not the end, because as I said, you can <laughs> argue it both ways. And this is where I'm coming to the optimistic part of my, uh, or hopeful at least, part of my presentation. For as long as there are no military bases of Russia on the territory of Belarus, and more importantly, for as long as Belarusian army has not become a part of an invasion in Ukraine, you can still argue that this critical line, the point of no return has not been passed. Because all we know from history, and for what, for example, differs the Cold, the Cold War period from the post-Soviet period, in terms of the Russian control over certain countries, is that there are no military bases of Russia on the, in the countries where they're not welcome. There was an exception, Sevastopol, and we know how that ended, but that was still an exception. And or, or the rule, if you want. So for as long as there are no these bases, you can still argue that the critical line has not been surpassed. And I will argue even more, even if that happens, the situation will not be irreversible. Because again, what we know from history, from the WTO, which was not in those days the World Trade Organization, but the Warsaw Treaty Organization. You can have bases for decades, but that's not the end of history of an individual country. So my recommendation, and this is where I'm ending, 
is that even if bad things happen, people should not give up in advance. They should not accept as a given and as a granted that the future of Belarus would always be either neutrality or Finlandization or a defense alliance with Russia. Things can change, circumstances can change. And I think what we should do is instead of promoting this narrative, be, to be, promote, be promoting the narrative about the possibility for Belarus to have a European future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arkady, uh, for actually shifting slightly from your um, apocalyptic uh, note to a bit more positive, hopeful uh, vision of the future. But it still brings us to a very important point, this military doctrine, which is there is nothing new, and yet we have 100,000 troops present at the moment on the territory of Belarus. I wonder if Ruth could possibly say a few more words, especially in terms of Russia's foreign policy and uh, sort of views from Europe on that as well. And then we'll take it from there for a small panel discussion. Please, Ruth. Yes, and thank you, and, and, and thank you for, for the invitation to take part in this extremely, extremely interesting and extremely important um, discussion. So I, I, I was asked you, and I want to talk about the, I guess, the, the Western perspective um, understood in, in very general terms. So, so really the, um, the perspective that we can see coming out of Western institutions, particularly NATO, uh, but also um, key European states, or some key European states, um, and I'll talk perhaps a little bit more about the UK, um, since that's where I am, uh, and also the US. I, mean, I think I would preface this by saying, as, as no doubt everyone is already very well aware, and as we can see uh, in relation to the debates about Ukraine at the moment, there is not a single Western perspective, right? So the, the, the position that we can see developing on, on questions of, you know, the, the Russia-Belarus relationship, but as well as Ukraine, um, the, the position that we can see emerging, say in Germany, looks look rather different to the position um, in the UK. But, but with that proviso, I think we can say some general things about um, Western, governmental and um, media and to a degree think tank perspectives on on all of this um, I should also say that this is not an endorsement right these views are not not necessarily mine um, so I think the first thing is to recognize is that for very many years I mean really at, at the whole of this century and to a very large degree, um, both Belarusian domestic politics and, and perhaps particularly foreign policy have been understood by Western states and by key institutions really as an extension of the Russian state. Um, there hasn't been a proper attempt in, in many cases to, to properly engage with the idea of Belarus as a distinctive international actor um, with a capacity to develop um, an, an independent, particularly an independent military policy um, for reasons that I will come to. But you know, if that's been the case generally, I think it's been particularly the case, of course, in the aftermath of the 2020 presidential elections. And since then really uh, most Western analysis, I would say, um, particularly the media and also a lot of governments have really portrayed uh, Lukashenko as entirely dependent on the Russian government. Um, and therefore, it's assumed really, all, all Belarusian government actions as being determined by the Kremlin. And this has been the case, I think, even when the actions of, of Lukashenko are, are obviously not really in the Russian government's interests, such as the threat last autumn to cut gas supplies to other European states. Even that was, was often interpreted as a manoeuvre by Putin. And so any further moves to formalise Russia-Belarusian uh, Russia -Belarusian integration are going to be understood in the same way as a function of Russian power over Belarus. Um, and they're often interpreted in Western analysis as evidence of Putin's ability to extract any price that he chooses for, for shoring up the Lukashenko presidency. 
but one of the things that that's striking, at least striking to me, is the, the complete absence of comment in um, certainly in, in the British and the American governments um, on these recent developments, um, on the, the additional moves to to push forward the Russia Belarus Union. There hasn't really been any engagement with these developments, and this reflects a long, much longer term lack of discussion about the specific idea of a Russia-Belarus union, um, including you know, any discussion really of, of a formal military union. To a significant extent, this has been reflective of a, as I think I said a moment ago, a kind of shameful lack of engagement um, with Belarus as, as a state before the 2020 elections. But I think it's also, and this has already been touched on, um, a, a product of the more than 20 years experience of the failure of the, uni uh, the union state to manifest as a, as a politically meaningful institution. And I think for a lot of Western governments and analysts, um, it falls therefore into the same category as uh, a number of other post-Soviet regional structures, the, U uh, the CIS initially, and to a degree, or maybe less so, uh, now uh, the CSTO really is paper institutions that reflect Russian dominance and which don't progress to more meaningful life because there's no incentive for Russia to develop them, or in some cases, because conflicts over their direction between Russia and the other member states prevent it. Of course, none of this is to say that Western states and analysts are not currently interested in Belarus as a European actor and in the fundamental role played in that regard by integration with Russia. And on the contrary, I think at the moment we can see that perhaps for the first time in the post-Cold War period, Belarus is now understood as an important factor in the European security situation. And the two areas in which this is most visible, of course, are the migrant crisis at the border with NATO and EU states and the current very significant buildup of, of Russian troops on Belarusian territory. In both cases, but particularly the latter, Belarus's role is often seen, I think, um, as little more than a, effectively a prosthesis for, for the Russian government, a means for the Russian government to extend its strategic space and to apply pressure to NATO and EU states um, via their weak spots, uh, and this is particularly true for the, the migrant crisis, of course. And, and very often um, the Belarusian government, Lukashenko's own motivations, um, again, particularly in the case of the migrant crisis, are too often neglected, though, though not entirely, but, but they're subsumed under, very often, under concerns about what Putin is doing um, in relation to these things. But there's also, I think, um, uh, uh, we're seeing, an ex at least in the UK, um, to the extent that Belarus is being talked about by the government, um, we're seeing a kind of widening of the narrative and some, and most strikingly the current British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, is interpreting um, the, the closer relationship of Russia and Belarus as part of a broader axis of authoritarianism that she thinks, or she, she has been talking about as emerging, something that includes China um, and other authoritarian states, and against which the UK um, in particular and the West in general has a duty to defend its allies and its values. And in this context, any development of the Russia-Belarus Union, to the extent that it's acknowledged, assumes not just an importance for the security of European and Central, of, of Eastern and Central Europe, but a significance for the future shape of international order. Obviously, whether that assumption has real world consequences for policy remaking remains to be seen, but if there is war in Ukraine, and particularly if it, that involves um, invasion from the territory of Belarus, that narrative of Belarusian integration with Russia as part of a global struggle between democracy and authoritarianism is only going to strengthen. Um, and I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you very much, Ruth. It gave us another uh, very comprehensive, and I would say, 
<clears throat> um, round in discussion uh, and uh, a focus uh, to continue. So, um, could I please, before we open the floor to the audience, um, I would like to have a very short, given the time, uh, discussion between ourselves. And the question, I would like to go back to the original question, who needs this union? What, and then I thought after listening to all of you, that what kind of new union actually both parties seek? Because some, someone in the audience actually mentioned that, uh, if anything, nothing has really changed and just rehashing and rehearsing the same points, except that uh, the military presence of Russia has clearly increased on, on, on the territory of Belarus. And it looks like this union is increasingly turning into political military union, security union of some sorts. And would Lukashenko still remain independent in his decision making in that sense? Uh, Ruth mentioned CSTO, and I, it, uh, I, I don't think it's a paper uh, institution, at least not the way it was. It, it acted uh, recently in Kazakhstan, how quickly it resolved the crisis. And now the fact that uh, we have this military uh, presence um, in Belarus, allegedly in preparation <clears throat> to all sorts of encroachments um, nearby, um, its 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 purpose and implications, well, some call it uh, bluntly, occupation of Belarus. Um, so, what kind of union? Why we need this union? Uh, and um, independence of Lukashenko in that sense. Who would like to go first? Franek. <laughs> Of course, of course, yes, yes. I think that's that's the right question. And when people in Belarus are asked about union with Russia, everyone understands different uh, things. I think in in the mindset of Belarusians, they see union both with Russia, with the European Union, as something mutually beneficial, transparent. They can freely travel. They can open business. So uh, it's it's about comfort of life. But when you ask them uh, through the surveys, you, we can see it about the currency should we have joint currency, then the number of supporters of union decreased 10 times. When you ask, should Belarus and Russia become the one state, this number is always between 4 and 7% maximum, never more than 7% of support. So when, when, when we ask about military bases, there will be more or less same number. So Belarusians want to be in union, preserving their status of the neutral country, the bridge between West and East, which became the part of mentality. When I was in school, in the first year grades of school, you're explained that Belarus is the bridge between Russia and the West. And I think this is the, the way of thinking of uh, uh, ordinary Belarusians right now. But they, they, they want to be the bridge. They want to be in unions. They want to be friends to everyone, but they don't want to lose what they have. Languages, their own territory, their own, own governance system, their currency, uh, the level of this uh, non-toxic uh, nationalism, it increased significantly in less in last uh, 20 years. When, uh, when I was in school, and when you ask about what, which country is the closest to Belarus, of course, it will be Moscow, Russia, it was like the, the the, the ultimate goal, you know, to finish somewhere in, in Russia, uh, working with business um, or making, making some profits there. Right now, it's not, not, not this way. Many IT companies uh, right now, they actually um, are very good symbol of this pat modern patriotism. They say, yes, right now we can't make business in Belarus. We emigrate in order to come back to Belarus. Students who are... Um, uh, accepted for the foreign uh, scholarships, many of them plan to come back to Belarus. And I think because they love Belarus, because they want to see Belarus independent, and they will never accept that Belarus will be part of, of uh, Russia, let's say. And uh, military bases, I think this is something which, is, which sounds like nightmare for many. Uh, mm -hmm. Belarusians don't know about existing military bases, uh, de facto we have, which are not... Uh, uh, military bases as, as we uh, usually uh, uh, see them. But there is a training center discussed near Grodna, which actually is supposed to become the real military base. And uh, why people don't protest? 
protest against it because they don't know. Why people don't protest uh, right now against Russian troops coming to the country? Because they don't see it. Uh, we are here on the Zoom. We know about it, but for absolute majority of the people uh, being who are in, in the country and living in the information vacuum, all these events are not happening. They don't, uh, they don't know what's going on. And this is the problem. And this creates additional risks for Belarus independence because many things can, can happen behind the scene. Thank you very much, Franek. You see, that, that, that actually poses a lot of questions in, 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 in some ways. So when we talk about union, uh, Belarus clearly was very much interested in economic benefits in the first place. But then these benefits uh, were provided to a degree uh, by the potential of the Eurasian Economic Union, which, to which Belarus was reluctant uh, uh, to, to, to join. Then why now? Why another union? And it looks like actually very much the incentive comes from Russia, who actually seeks very much the security uh, political union. And reading into actually the commentary by Dmitry Mizentsev, uh, about the what he called new military do doctrine. The purpose of this new military doctrine, as he said, is to ensure consistency of defense policy and rapid response to any insurgencies or problems. So um, what kind of union? Arkady, you look very stern there. I'm not sure I actually understand what we are talking about, because if we are talking about union, as Franek has just said, something vague, amorphous, which nobody understands, this is one story. If we are talking the, about the union state, which is uh, something bigger than an international organization and something less than a state, uh, if we're talking about the latter, that probably only Lukashenko needs it because he thinks or thought, used to think that this is a, uh, a channel through which he can get extra money from Russia. I don't think he thinks that now because Russia has, been, has become much less generous and lavish than it used to be. I mean, again, I've been arguing that the Russian policy can be called same for less. And I've been arguing it well before the August 2020. Uh, in order to continue the defense cooperation, you don't need union. If you're Russia and if you want to, if you want the defense alliance, you don't need the union state. You just make a defense alliance. I'm not even sure whether Russia wants a proper defense alliance. It wants the right and the actual possibility to use Belarusian territory in their space if need be. In order to achieve that, uh, you need to corner the ruler like Lukashenko. And this is, I think, what it has been doing more or less successfully, still more or less, not 100% successfully, more or less successfully. But again, that's why I started that talking about integration makes less, just, just to have a discussion about that has less and less sense. You have to see, it's, it's a relationship which, which could have been the examples of parallels to which could be found in the 19th century. A big state and a small state and a big state offers something to the small state it cannot refuse. But you don't need all this cover, you don't need the fleur, you don't need the fog. You just come and talk straight. We'll see how that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And being conscious of the time, um, I will probably now open the floor to, to the audience. And uh, there are actually um, some good questions, one for Ruth, and one I think I will direct to Vladislav. So Ruth, there is a question from Anna Davidson. Um, I will read it to you. You said that Western um, analysis portray the Belarusian government's actions as determined by the Kremlin. So in what ways would you say that Lukashenko's behavior has been independent of the Russian government? In what situations have you seen that he is or the Belarusian government are confident going against the Kremlin? Yeah, good question. I mean, I'm not actually suggesting the latter at all. I don't think that's something that we can see, right? Um, it's more that I think 
because I mean, as I'm, I'm sure everybody here is is all too aware, you know, for for a very long time um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a kind of analytical disengagement by um, by Western political elites from from thinking about the post-Soviet space, right? Um, from thinking about the states that had been part of the Soviet Union. And, and far too often the focus was exclusively on Russia. Um, there's been very little focus on Belarus, um, which is one of the, the, the major problems from my perspective. Um, and it, I think that feeds into a tendency. Um, you know, politicians, uh, I probably, I don't know, this is my just my perspective as a former civil servant, but politicians will often go for the, the you know, the easiest line, right? Um, the easiest thing to understand. And the easiest thing for Western politicians to understand, I think, really, is that Belarus is basically, you know, a subset of Russia from a, a geopolitical point of view, from the point of view of, of uh, military concerns. That we therefore don't need to consider whether um, the Belarusian government has its own interests um, in relation to the West, for instance. I mean, obviously that's been slightly different in the economic sphere and the energy sphere, but on, on military questions, they've really, Belarus and Russia have been treated as, as one and the same. Belarus simply is a, a subset of Russia. And I don't think that's helpful for all sorts of reasons. Firstly, as I say, because you can see that, for example, um, when Lukashenko threatened to turn off the, the gas taps um, in the autumn, that was obviously not something that the Russian government looked on favorably. So you can see cases where there are divergences. But also, you know, the tendency by a lot of Western media in particular to treat the migrant crisis simply as something that, that Putin has decided that he wants to happen, right? Um, and that the, the Belarusian government really has nothing to do with it. Um, it's simply there to act as a cipher for, for Russia. And, and that, of course, neglects um, Lukashenko's own um, issues with the European Union and the desire to, to test um, the European Union. So I think, you know, if we're going to make, if, if Western states are going to make sense of um, Belarus as a political and a military actor, there needs to be a recognition that, that Belarus, you know, exists as a, as, as a political and military entity, however dominated militarily um, by, by Russia. You know, it, it's not helpful simply to continue to neglect um, Belarus as, a, as an important feature of the European security landscape, which I think is what has been happening. Okay. Thank you very much, Ruth, for, for this answer. There is a question also from Jakub Wallenstein, uh, which I will direct to Vlad uh, Vladislav. Um, uh, and I'll read it uh, quickly. Some argue that Russia supports Lukashenko because, uh, because uh, uh, Belarus is the, their best guarantee for safeguarding their geopolitical interests. He would and could never take the country west. And that in order to stop supporting him and maybe even embrace a more pluralistic, not say democratic alternative in Belarus, they would have to have a different type of guarantee or like military base. What do you make of this argument? Look, uh, there are two points here to mention. First is about uh, Ms. Tikhanovska and uh, the way she came to maybe not to power, but uh, as a result, he she showed in, in presidential elections in August 2020. For Mr. Putin, I would say uh, it's the very idea that someone who challenged uh, your ally in a democratic uh, fashion, democratic manner, and came to power and you know approaches you as a uh, partner in negotiations is absolutely you know uh, impossible to to, to 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 take it granted so from my point of view if uh, there might be there was another chance for Belarusian opposition you know to uh, build a relationship with Russia if for example it were someone who well before uh, the presidential campaign uh, made uh, good ties with Moscow uh, was 
you know, greeted in Moscow and then Russian elite as well as a possible contender to Lukashenko. For example, as uh, Mr. Babariko seemed, he, he, he might be like, uh, a person like this. In this case, yes, might be. Moscow would speak to this person and acknowledge him or her as a president and uh, build up their strategy towards uh, new Belarus. In uh, Tikhanovsky case, it's you know it's absolutely against any rules that Mr. Putin wants uh, and uh, is ready to uh, to follow. So the democratic election is, and the person who wins the democratic elections couldn't be you know Putin's best friend, as Yushchenko never was, as uh, Poroshenko also never was, and. In many cases, we have the same situation. This is the first point. The second point is about the West. Yes, of course, uh, the, the security issue for Mr. Putin looms very large. Uh, and uh, all this quarrel with Ukraine and with the West, the recent quarrel is going because of uh, Russia presumably won security guarantees. And of course, Belarus, under any other person uh, of the Lukashenko, because he is uh, assumed as a rogue leader. So uh, Belarus might be a good, uh, uh, I would say, a partner to the Western countries, and this is unacceptable for Russia. So yes, there are two points here. First, uh, personality of Ms. Tikhanovskaya, uh, and the second, the security concern that will prevent Moscow from you know, accepting this alternative, I would say. Yeah, it's a very complex issue. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vladislav. Um, on that, actually, I would like to pick up another question from the audience, which I will probably... May, may, may I jump in here, Ileana? Yes, yes, please do. Very quickly, two sentences. Um, Lukashenko, without the military base, is a guarantee that Belarus will not go west. The, the, the military base alone will not be able to guarantee that, yeah. because if there is a different government, the base will not help. I mean, that's what Putin remembers from his own young years in the DDR and how all that ended. Lukashenko and the military base is, of course, even a better guarantee, but Lukashenko <laughs> alone is enough. That's the dilemma of Russia. That's why, that's why they, they, again, I've been arguing this for decades, that they will stick with him. Yes. yes. Although, despite all the things that they don't like about him, but I mean, they, they cannot, they cannot, they don't really know how to get rid of him and keep everything that is guaranteed under him still guaranteed. But it's another long story. But base is not, is not a replacement of Lukashenko. Okay, um, that was actually very opportune because the question I was going to pick out from the audience uh, was about this kind of geopolitical consequences. So I'll read it to you. That's from Alexander Amonak. The Belarusian protest did not include a geopolitical aspect, but rather it has geopolitical consequences. What kind of consequences do you think they are? Well, we already mentioned, you know, Lukashenko plus military base is superb guarantee for Russia to retain the status quo. But uh, when would the balance be tipped off in one way or another? Anyone? I mean, I'll just jump in very quickly if I can, just to. I guess to to come back to something I was saying before that I think it's if not geopolitical consequence in, in the normal sense I think that the extent to which um, since 2020 uh, but particularly in the last few months since the start of the migrant crisis um, and now with the crisis in Ukraine the, the extent to which um, the 2020 election and its aftermath is being cast by some Western political figures as part of a, a kind of evidence of a kind of Manichaean struggle emerging between authoritarianism and, and democracy, between light and dark. Um, and certainly our current foreign secretary seems to be positioning herself um, very much in, in, in that way. Um, I mean, that, that has significant implications, I think, for how states like the UK um, in, engage um, with, with how you go about resolving 
the current crisis, for example, you know, if it's seen not just as um, a question of European security, for example, but in the aftermath of the um, the 2020 elections, um, as evidence of these kind of blocks developing um, based on divergent values, but with military uh, geopolitical consequences attached to them, um, then, then that becomes very significant, I think. And it actually, of course, makes um, crises much harder to resolve because they become not just about the crises, but about much more fundamental issues. I think one colossal uh, geopolitical implication of the, of the protests the way they went was that the West, that it, it allowed the West to stay absolutely passive in the first several months because they basically said, it's not about us. It's not about geopolitics. We can withdraw. And uh, this is something we are harvesting now because it's the unwillingness of the West to go into clashes with Russia over Belarus 18 months ago uh, was, one, was definitely a factor that convinced some people in Kremlin that the West is weak. And the West will always be def- will always be retreating as soon as you threaten seriously enough, and that's that's obviously something that started during the autumn of 2020 when the West was absolutely unwilling to do anything. Maybe because it had its fingers burnt in Ukraine in 14, 15. Maybe maybe because it thought, and again. Uh, we cannot criticize it for thinking that way, that Belarus was already part of the Russian sphere of influence and it had no chance to, to, to snatch it from Russia's hands. But whatever was it, the fact that the geopolitical pro-European um, slogans were absent from the protest uh, pretty much facilitated for the West the task of staying idle. Thank you. Uh, if I may, if I may, Monica, yeah, I, I want to agree and disagree with Arkadia um, uh, on some points. Uh, I don't think it's a mistake of protest um, because it's not something which was uh, stated or um, uh, developed by leaders of the group. It was something which was living in Belarusian society. They didn't want to get into the geopolitical fight. And they didn't see the fight against Lukashenko as the part of geopolitics. And we were not able to shape uh, this as a narrative because we were not in control of the crowd. Crowd developed the narrative and this narrative just existed when we just tried to become the voice for for the crowd. Uh, But what really what I agree on that it's not uh, Lukashenko and Putin who are strong, but this is the West who are Western countries who are weak or at least uh, seem to be weak for Lukashenko and Putin. Because Lukashenko actually, uh, he enjoyed many, many months of non-reaction when sanctions got imposed there with many loopholes and they just raised the price for potash and uh, potash continued to come to um, to buyers. Uh, after Protasevich and even now with the cow, there is no unity among uh, Western countries. And Lukashenko, of course, and migrant crisis, the same story. So he basically uh, didn't face much reaction or response, which created the feeling of impunity and the understanding that he can continue and raise stakes. And this was for Lukashenko, this was for Putin, the same story. And I think if, if the West right now will put Belarus on the agenda, will be same firm in statements at least about Belarus, like about Ukraine, it could help us a lot to prevent the worst case scenario. And let me uh, propose here some recommendation for the international community and for the European Union. So uh, I I really think it's the good moment for uh, the European Union, for um, signatories of Budapest Memorandum, for those who who care about Belarus uh, to release the statement position uh, uh, like Americans released Belarus Democracy and Sovereignty Act, something that, that will raise the cost and that will declare that Belarus, uh, Belarusians deserve to decide, um, uh, to determine their future by themselves. And no Russia or other countries allowed to misuse Belarus in their geopolitical or other interests. 
we uh, we had uh, many discussions with European parliamentarians, etc. But there is no such law. Other thing, not law, but but act something that could serve as the law, and will uh, make uh, create commitment for uh, for our allies to defend Belarus independence. We see here many words of support to for Ukraine and very little about Belarus. It's also important to support Belarusian identity. Belarusian language, Belarusian media, everything which is uh, all, everything which is strengthening Belarusian identity, and this could be uh, even stronger than military bases. When identity will be strong, when Belarusians will feel uh, Belarusians will cherish Belarusian independence, then uh, the integration, occupation, or foreign influence will be much less uh, effective. It's very important to increase sanctions, increase pressure on, on the regime, but also make sure Russia does not misuse this weakness of, of the regime and is not buying out the enterprises, uh, which is also a possible scenario. And it's very important to not legitimize Lukashenko by speaking to him, talking to him, calling him, uh, sending ambassadors. Some European states are considering sending ambassadors and presenting credentials to Lukashenko, as well accepting his ambassadors in their country. In this moment, it will be a very you know, bad signal to Belarus society as well. Um, and I think this combination of pressure and assistance to civil society, which is continuing struggle uh, in very bad circumstances, it could help us actually to, to uh, remain uh, resistant on one hand and to make this um, uh, worst case scenario less possible. Thank you, Franek. Um, now we are coming to a close, and I'm delighted that Franek actually has started this uh, kind of con conclusion with uh, offering recommendations. Can I please invite then Vladislav, R Ruth, and maybe Arkady would like to add um, um, recommendations ba ba uh, based on our discussion, but also your knowledge of, of the issue. Vladislav, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So look, I agree with uh, most of what was said. Uh, I think that um, actually there are not so many recommendations these days because I agree absolutely with uh, Arkady who said that uh, the time is lost uh, and uh, I do not see any kind of events which can ignite another wave of sanctions. These days we should just, uh, the West should just wait and see what happens after this uh, new debate and uh, voting of the new constitution, maybe some new protests may arise, maybe Lukashenko, some, some Lukashenko's moves uh, might be, uh, you know, might cause another round of sanctions. But anyway, uh, I would say that now we are in a kind of uh, rather stable situation with no any, you know, breakthrough inside. So for coming one or two years, I would say that everything will be in place. Uh, I absolutely exclude uh, any open attack on Ukraine uh, in, in coming days and weeks. So it's, uh, it's like business as usual, nothing will happen actually. And uh, the West uh, capacity, the West ability to change the situation is very limited to this. Okay, thank you, Vladislav. Ruth, please. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with, with all of that, I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, Part of the problem from for thinking about a kind of Western response is, of course, as we've all touched on, that you know we can't really think about a unified West um, in this regard because states have different interests and and, and different perspectives um, on on what's been happening. And I think one of the reasons why you didn't see a stronger response in 2020 was that of course the um the then um government in the US the Trump administration had a pretty clear policy of of not engaging at all with questions of democracy and human rights in in the post soviet space or in any kind of former um soviet state so that you know that that is kind of symptom well an example of um, the, the difficulty that we have in thinking about a coordinated Western response, and of course, even a coordinated European response is difficult, given that um, you know my own country has now left the, the European Union, so you know we we can't work cooperatively entirely successfully with with our European partners on Belarus or, or anything else. Um, but there is going to have to be a. a and some attempts to engage in, in more coordination. Um, if 
if Western states want Belarus, you know, their, their engagement with Belarus, their relationship to Belarus to change at all. And I, one of the things that worries me is that I don't think Western states are sufficiently focused on Belarus to actually sit down and try to work out their differences um, on, on what, what could or should be done. Although I entirely agree that the, um, the issue of constitutional changes, if that does produce protests, may, may invite a more coordinated response. But I'm not optimistic. Thank you, Ruth. Arkady, what, would you like what to... I'm going to say is obviously easier said than done. And yet I will say it. <laughs> There's no way for Belarus to go back to the social contract it had used to have with Lukashenko, not only before 2020 and not only before the protests of 2017, but even before 2010. The country is completely different from what it used to be 15, 20 years ago. We, we, we know enough of that. So despite the massive emigration, despite all the tragedy that happened, it's not the end of days. People will think, they will look around, uh, they will not be happy with what they will be offered by this regime because this regime is not going to change. This regime, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. He will be talking the same talk he's been talking for the last 27 years. What does that mean in terms of recommendations? This new, newly growing and newly th and differently thinking people will need to be shown an alternative. If they, are, if they are told all the time that, yeah, the majority supports the union with Russia, the neutrality, the neo-Finlandization, I mean, they will be suffering from the syndrome of learned helplessness. That's the only thing. So they, will, they need to be shown that actually there is a different future for the country and for them individually. And in that, there is a role both for the West and for the opposition, which is abroad, because Again, I understand that the politicians should see what the potential voters think. They cannot be too detached from the mainstream thought. But that's the function of a leader. You need to lead. You need to change the public opinion, however difficult that might be. But of course, as in a small caveat about the West in particular, I would make sure that some of the people which lobbied the policy of rapprochement with Lukashenko in 2015-2020 would be held responsible. They would need to be fired and that needs to be known because such a terrible miscalculation that was, way, that was made by the European Union, which led to the fact that the pro-European cohort in Belarus was totally, uh, totally weakened. Yeah. Be yeah, before that, it, it disappeared basically before. And mm -hmm. then the, the, the people in Belarus were not prepared Arkady, uh, to I protest to under the there. slogans of the European choice. Those people who, who, who lobbied that policy need to be held responsible. Okay. Thank you, Arkady. Indeed, I think uh, on this more or less hopeful note that the future is actually in our own hands and more importantly, still in the hands of Belarusians, um, uh, I think we, we, we are going to finish this discussion. Can I just also mention, there were some questions from the audience, including, for example, from Anais Marine, um, about a kind of constitution and text of constitution. Can I please invite you to follow our program because we will have a separate talk on constitution. And I please, please, please ask these questions then. But in the meantime, what is left uh, for me to say that we hope you will join us next Thursday uh, on the discussion about sanctions and counter sanctions for, for, for Belarus and, and by Belarus. And uh, in the meantime, I would like to thank our speakers for this absolutely fascinating discussion. And you see, that's why we find it difficult to stop it, but because you, you brought out so many important issues to, to, to the front. And I also would like to thank the Office of Svetlana Tikhanovska and Oxford Belarus Observatory for organizing it. Thank you, and we hope to see you next time. Bye.